All right, welcome to the live stream, everybody. Uh, what we're gonna do is answer your home buying questions. So my name is Kyle Seagraves, here with me, Dan Frio. Uh, we were just talking about his upcoming birthday. You're about to be 30? 59. 59. I'll Whoa, be 59. Okay. 59. So maybe we oh, get I a know, little- I know, uh, I know, I know. And I just talked to your like, dad. Uh, birthday we'll cake emojis stuff. in the chat or something? <laughs> and I just talked to your dad this morning and we're the same age. So. You know, no, no old jokes. <laughs> no, never, never at all. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to answer your home buying questions in here. So leave those in the chat and we'll pull them up. Um, already have a couple of people in here. Um, a couple of regulars, Miss Morgan, thank you for being here again. And Amanda as well. Um, and Caleb, thank you for being here and for asking your questions. So we're going to dive into those questions. Um, TR just left a comment as well. Um, and first, what we want to do is go into what's happening with rates and economics. So if you're new here, uh, you know, remember last stream, I told you there was clapping that kept coming up. The yeah. MBS charts clap. Oh, there they are. That's what's happening. <laughs> you know what? If you go to the out. side, I've been posting on there today. I, I actually, I've never... I always thought that it was an internal function that they had that people, you know, the, the lenders would go in there and tell you when rates uh, get cut. But this is a good segment if you guys, if uh, for all those economic people out there and if you're really trying to track rates or you're a mortgage person out there, this is a system you guys got to use. So Kyle, you want to do your thing and then I'll, I'll jump in on this if you want or you want me to just take it from here? I would say go ahead and let's just jump into uh, in general what's going on with uh economic data, what's going on with inflation, how's it impacting things. Um, maybe I'll jump over into what rates are currently right now. Um, yeah. doo -doo -doo, and then we can jump into MBS. So yep. here's where rates are currently. Um, this would be for a conventional loan. And then Dan, if you want to go ahead and take it away with what's yep. going on with so if economic you guys data. Watch me, if you guys watch me daily, what I always say is, you know, right here, over here, right here, these are the top six products people use when they're buying their first house, okay? But with the gist of these rates right here, what they are or what they represent is these people are buying their first home. It's going to be their primary home and it's a single family, okay? But you guys might say, okay, well, that's me. Well, these people have a 780 credit score and they're putting down 25%. So, I almost assure you that that's probably not you out there. So Kyle, if you can jump over to the MBS Live, um, every morning what I do is I show you guys the economic news that's coming in and based on that news, you know, how is the bond market working? So if you really wanna pay attention what the heck's going on with mortgage rates, you're not gonna watch what the Federal Reserve's doing, kinda sorta, um, but you're not gonna watch like 10 year treasuries, you're not gonna watch any other bond other than this thing that you're seeing on your screen right now. This is, if you look at the top list, it'll say 30 year YRUMBS. So what exactly that is, it's a mortgage bond, okay? All you need to know in this is, this bond is what basically creates your mortgage rate. It's this the yield on this bond, plus what's called LLPAs, and those are loan level price adjustments. Those are things that Kyle go over a lot of times on his channel. Those are things like, you know, how, how much of a hit do you get your, to your interest rate if you have a lower score? Well, if you have a 680 credit score, your loan level price adjustment might be maybe a quarter percent to the rate because you don't have that much, that stellar of credit. You're not putting, you're, you're putting down 20%, not 10% down. Well, that's an LLPA, you're gonna get a better rate. Okay, so th things like that. What you're seeing on your screen right now is, is the mortgage bond. Now, how that's, this difference differs from a lot is what you really wanna pay attention to on this is you want the price of the bond going up. Okay, as it goes up in any bond, what happens is the yield comes down. Okay, so the more you pay for a bond, the lower the yield. And I, I do this at probably once a month on my videos. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a little teaching on the mortgage-backed securities market or the bond market real quick, and I'll be as fast as I can. I'm gonna show you how when the price goes up, the yields come down. Okay, so when you buy a bond, usually it has, I'm just going to use a maturity value of a hundred bucks. It's usually about a thousand dollars, but let's just say it's a hundred bucks. Okay, so today I give you $50 for my mortgage bond. Okay, so I give you 50 bucks and you give me a mortgage bond. Well, that bond matures next year. I'm just making this as simple as I can. So I give you the bond back next year and you give me a hundred bucks because the bond's face value is a hundred dollars. I paid you a lower price for that bond of $50, okay? So I paid you 50, you gave me a hundred bucks back. What is my yield? I basically doubled my money. So my yield is a hundred percent, okay? So now let's increase that payment. 
So now today I give you $100 for that $100 matured bond. Okay. So you give me the bond. I sit on it for a year. I give you my bond back and you give me my $100 back. Well, what is my yield now that I paid a much higher price? Zero. I paid you 100 You gave me 100 back. So do you see when, when I paid lower price, the yield is much higher. So what you're seeing on the screen is we want the prices to go up. Kyle, can you click the five-day? Look, we just got slaughtered since last Thursday when the CPI and some employment numbers came out. This is, again, as that price comes down, you can see it where it's been. You know, we just had a little bit of a rally today and a much, much needed rally. But that drop, that price drop from the, the peak at the, up the left down to the bottom, that equates out to about a half a percent rate increase to mortgage rates. So today we see the MBS price, you see it right now, price is up 47 ticks. That means we're probably going to get a recovery on interest rates of about an eighth. So you're going to see mortgage rates start to decline. I think they're already down about 0.07 so far today, but you're going to see continued um, basically ease and easing on rates. Now, what's yeah. going on? That's the conundrum. Nobody, you know, we saw the inflation numbers last week. You know, the CPI came in a little bit 0.1 higher than expected. The jobs report came in. It was a little bit juicier than expected. Now you have the Federal Reserve meeting, you know, all over the place. And they're saying, you know, our rate cuts are going to be probably further out there. So th they're probably going to be coming soon. You know, who knows when? And I try, I, I try my darndest to help predict this. Um, but you know, we just don't know when that data is going to come in. But I'm on the Federal, Federal Reserve side. I'm like, don't reduce rates until you really squish out all this inflation. And retail mm -hmm. sales came in on Monday and they were like up from a, like a negative 0.1 to a four. And that, that means a ton of people keep spending money and spending money and spending money. So the Federal Reserve is like, well, if you got a bunch of money out there and you're spending it, you don't really yeah. care about rates, so we'll just keep rates higher than, than expected. So that's yeah. basically what's going on right now. World events aren't helping. Oil prices rising aren't helping. All this is just completely bad news when it comes to the economy and what the heck the Federal Reserve is going to do. That's it. <laughs> that's yeah, my economic like class well, for today. And, and to give, I think sometimes people get a little bit confused about the Fed and what interest rates they control and what and how inflation yeah. impacts mortgages. And like Dan was talking about, um, so inflation is like the enemy of bonds. More, you know, mortgage bonds, for instance, um, are 30 years in term. So higher inflation means that uh, whoever holds that bond gets less and less money over time as inflation grows. Um, so when inflation goes up, that's when you start seeing mortgage rates go up because Investors are expecting higher returns because inflation is eating away at the cost there. And the Federal Reserve's job is to make sure that we don't go into hyperinflation. One of the tools that they use is a federal funds rate, which is when you hear the Fed talking about changing rates, they're changing the federal funds rate, not mortgage rates. Um, and kind of what's happening with inflation is the Fed has bumped up rates pretty significantly. Um, and it's almost like uh, if the federal funds rate was like a brake on a car, the more they increase the rate, the harder they're pushing on the brake pedal. But what's happening is it's almost like the economy, if the economy is the car, they're pressing on the brake pedal harder and harder and it's still not slowing down. And that's a little bit of where mortgage rates are starting to go, have been going up, um, is you have investors starting to fear that even though the Federal Reserve increased rates, the car is still not slowing down um, or yeah. slowing down as much as they want it to. Um, and that's why there's, uh, an increase in rates here, even though the Federal Reserve has uh, changed the rates. So the Federal Reserve isn't increasing mortgage rates. Um, actually, the, increasing the federal funds rate should have an impact of lowering inflation and lowering mortgage rates in the future. But rates are where they're at because of inflation, not because of the federal funds rate. Um, Great so, analogy. Uh, I stole it. It's not mine. <laughs> uh, let's jump into some questions here. Um, we have quite a few uh, loaded up and I, we probably should start from the top maybe with uh, just a, our timer because I think we always forget about that. Um, sure. And, you know, I, apparently I'm the one who talks a lot. Uh, <laughs> and I just had a 20 minute dissertation on the economy. Hey, folks, we also need to know where you're where where are you? And all, all we need to do is just, you can abbreviate the state if you want. We're trying to get New York and California and everywhere in between uh, on our sites. And we're trying to pick a great time to do that. So if you'd let us know where you are and then uh, give us the what's what's the sign thing we're giving houses. 
or money sign or whatever. It's like when you, we, when you uh, like something, give us like a, a house emoji or something like that. So there was, we know some, we're, there was we're something earlier. Uh, what was it on the last stream? I can't remember. All right. We got uh, Cincinnati, Clarksville, New York, Florida, North Carolina. And then we can probably jump into um, the uh, the grant finder too to walk through some grants. So oh, yeah. uh, nobody knows walk. about it. So we got to go through it. <laughs> um, yeah, I can give a, a quick little teaser here before we jump into these questions. Um, the, uh, on the grant finder, let me just jump into some of the qualifying areas here. Let me enter in just some basic info. Um, so all of these areas, let me try to get all of them on the screen at once. Uh, just there. Um, all of these areas qualify for the grant finder. So we have three grants up to $10,000. So we'll walk through this uh, as well. And I cut you off. No, not at all. Okay. Um, sweet. All right. Miss Morgan, uh, said, Hey guys, can you go over the USDA loan and the Gus approval system at a 640 score? Um, would they need to dive deeper into that or dive deeper into credit at that score? So USDA does use an underwriting system called Gus, it's the guaranteed underwriting system. You really don't need to know that as a home buyer. It's something that we handle as loan officers. Um, to use Gus, you need a 640 score. Basically, USDA loans are easier. Um, you're going to get better rates if you have a 640 and higher score. If you have below a 640, then USDA requires a manual underwrite. And in that means you're going to expect a higher interest rate. The process is going to require more documentation. And also, you're not going to be able to get as big as a loan amount as you would with USDA uh, using Gus. So manual underwrites can be difficult. Not a lot of lenders do them. 640 is the minimum for USDA uh, Gus. Um, I'm running out of time. Uh, so I would shoot for a 680 with USDA for the better chance of approval. Um, but 640 can work. It just can be a little um, dicey at, at points if you have a high debt to income ratio, for instance, 640 would be tough. It was close enough. Yeah, it was real good. <laughs> okay, I got to um, ask this question, Amanda, before you go, because you're here on every event and thank you. What do you do if you don't mind answering that? If, are you a realtor? Uh, because you come on every every week and we love it. And we actually were talking about you before we went live. We saw you post a comment and I'm like, I got it. I don't mean to call you out, but I, I'd love to know what you do because you're here every week and you ask great questions. And you got like a, a nice professional headshot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's nice. Uh, but you said, I love being able to join these live Q&As. Thanks so much for all the information you provide. Um, well, thank you, Amanda, for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, Amanda said, uh, they're a psychologist, first time home buyer. Um, really? Fantastic. Uh, Caleb, what are your thoughts on as is home sales? Um, does this affect market value? Um, in other words, are they typically cheaper? Take it away. I, I would say no, as is just means like I, they don't want to mess with anything. Like for example, my house, my house is probably 40 years old. There's probably some little things that need done. Do I want to mess with it if I'm, when I'm go going to sell my house? No, not really. I mean, if there was a huge issue when it came to the appraisal, they were really tagging me for something. Yeah, I'd fix it. Uh, but as is, most people are going to want to sell it as is because they don't want they don't want to do anything. They don't want to work on the house or do anything uh, minor to fix the property. Or it might be an as is property that means you can only pay cash for it because it's that bad of shape that they know it's not going to pass any criteria when it comes to loans. So it has to, you have to be really careful when it comes to that. But you know, do your due, dil due diligence, check the house, go through it thoroughly. If you're going to go buy it, you know, make sure you get an inspection done, not an appraisal, but an inspection, and then make your decision on what you're going to do from there. I gave you a little bit of extra time. Well, I gave you a little bit of extra time. Okay. <laughs> I, I had a reset. I'm going to add 25 seconds on my end. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll, We'll have our little counters going. Um, T.R. said, uh, hi, gentlemen. Thank you for doing this. Do you see many situations where the buyer has to increase their down payment uh, 3 to 5% to be competitive in a multiple offer situation? Um, yeah. From 3 to 5%, maybe not as much. I think what is going to sway things more. Hold on. We, we didn't go mute, folks. He's got to wait about 10 second, seconds so he doesn't you know, take up all the time. You got to be fair here. Uh, you guys got to come out here every week. Then you'll finally whoa, whoa, get whoa, whoa. my Well, you're stealing my time. Now I got to pause it. Um, <laughs> okay, so more likely, instead of the down payment being 
something that a seller is more interested in is going to be more of the deposit on the contract where they might require more um, earnest money on the deposit. Uh, contract than changing the down payment necessarily. Sometimes sellers can be sticklers about they want a buyer who does 20% instead of 3% or 5% or whatever. Going from 3 to 5%, uh, I doubt that's going to change things um, for a seller. If so, they have probably 100 offers they're looking at because your down payment doesn't impact the seller. What does impact the seller though is the deposit on the contract. It's basically the skin in the game on the contract that you get back uh, credited towards your closing costs or down payment at the end. I'm gonna use up my extra time here. Um, but that is money that the seller could get if you don't follow through um, with the contract. Just just an FYI, I got two contracts in yesterday. Both of them were California. Both of them had to overbid because there was multiple, multiple, multiple offers. Um, they got it, they, got, we, they won the bids. I actually called the selling agents and kind of, you know, said, hey, I can close in 21 days. I got the people there completely approved. We just need an appraisal, blah, 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 blah. But there are still bidding wars out there. And it, it's crazy. You know, yeah. even at these rates, and I, I I know prices are inflated. And that's why we're not here on a weekly basis saying you have to buy a house. We're just saying if you're in a position of life financially, in the life stages you're in or whatever, and home ownership is your goal, we'd love to be your 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 piece to help you with the financing part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's the, that is an interesting thing. i I know sometimes there's a little bit of pushback from people where they're like, how are you like, uh, I know there's, there have been other people on YouTube who have like, they've quit being in real estate. Cause they're like, I don't ethically believe anyone should buy a house right now. Um, but people buy houses most of the time, I, I would say at least a hundred, I mean, I mean, made a hundred percent, 90% of the people that we work with are buying, not because they want to try to buy a house to make money off of the house not because it was they're trying to use it as an investment or trying to gain appreciation, but because uh, they are they need to either get a smaller home, they need to downsize, maybe something needs to be more accessible, um, their family is growing, so they need more room, they, need, they just got a third dog, so they need more uh, yard. Um, that's usually why people are looking to buy. Uh, Tierra thinks that we're hilarious, so I'm gonna. <laughs> well, thanks. Gonna take that. We in. gotta make uh, it somewhat fun. I mean, it's you guys are out there looking to buy your first house. It's the anxiety has got to be out the roof. And especially when you really don't know where to go. Rates are all over the map. House prices are going up and people say they're coming down. You know, they're going to crash or whatever. But then you go out there and you you finally get approved to buy a house. You go out and try to find a house and everybody and their mother's bidding, overbidding you. So again, yeah. we're, we're just here to help. So thanks for joining um, us. DK729. Uh, hey guys, how can I pay off my 200,000 30 year mortgage as a 15 year current interest rate is 2.75. Um, love the show. So it's really pretty easy. Um, what you would do is you can just uh, go to any mortgage calculator um, and take put in 200,000, put in your rate, put in 30 years, and then change that to 15 years. And it's going to show you the payment. So take that new payment minus your current payment. Uh, find the difference. And then that's the extra you're going to pay every single month on your mortgage. Um, so you just pay it. Uh, you just pay extra as if it was a higher 15 year payment. So um, it should be no problem for your whoever's holding your mortgage currently to be able to apply that um, towards the principal of the loan. Just make sure that when you do have that extra, um, classify it that it's going towards the principal of the loan, not principal and interest of the loan. Because Applying it to the principal is going to help you actually pay it down quicker, which is what you're looking for. Also, one more step to validate that is when you get your statements each month, go back and make sure that extra payment that you sent in was applied to principal. It just didn't go into your escrow. I did that years ago when I was much younger. I started paying an extra two, three, four hundred bucks a month. After about a year, I got a refund check back saying my escrow was too high. And I'm like, I didn't want it going to escrow. Um, but mm. I, it, I had a newborn at the time, so I could I could use that two grand that came back to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Amanda said, I recently learned that many buyers are waiving their inspection to make their offer more attractive. Um, this blows my mind. Can you share your thoughts on this? Yes, unfortunately, this is not new. This has been going on. Well, it's been an option for people for a long time. But this even started happening in the beginning of kind of the COVID surge around housing, where people were putting, you know, up against tons of other buyers. And to make their offer more attractive to a seller, they basically said, I'm not going to have a home inspector come in, we'll basically purchase the home as is. I think it's crazy. We would never recommend doing this. I don't even know if like, 
legally it's something that we could recommend without there being repercussions to it um it's just it's really terrible advice for anyone who's supposed to have like a fiduciary responsibility um as a real estate professional so i think it's a terrible situation unless you personally are an inspector um, or maybe you have a friend who walked through the house with you and you're very confident and you have a large amount of cash um, to be able to make repairs if needed, maybe. Um, but for most people, 80% of people, I would not recommend waiving inspections um, to make your offer more attractive. No, not at all. Um, again, unless you have a ton of cash, because it's just stuff that can come. You might be able to get the house, uh, but if something goes wrong, or do you have $10,000? Uh, to be able to make that fix happen. Um, we just don't want you getting into debt uh, after you move into a house to pay for emergencies. Um, once you get qualified and approved with an estimate, how long will that offer last? Usually it depends on the loan type, but usually 90 to 120 days. It depends on which loan type. And basically the only thing that would expire is your credit report. Um, or if you change jobs or got a pay raise or whatever, that would change. But the only thing is we would just have to refresh your credit score and uh, kind of go from there. So no, no big deal. If you got pre-approved and you didn't really change your lifestyle or bills or anything, you'll be good to go. Uh, let's see. What are the chances of getting a USDA guaranteed loan if you have an 800 credit score, 100,000 salary, using only using my income since my wife is a homemaker with no income, but we have less than 2% of $320,000 loan? Um, I mean, that sounds like a very uh, easy USDA scenario, except for the salary piece. Um, you like how I didn't... Uh, yeah. Yeah, Sometimes I forget for when, well, I jump into it and I forget to press the button over here. Um, so <laughs> don't worry, it will, we'll, we'll, I'll even it out for you. Um, <laughs> so USDA does have an income limit and it's dependent on the county that you're looking in. Um, there are not a lot of counties that I've seen that go above a hundred thousand uh, dollars. Usually uh, the majority of counties tend to be around the 80 to $90,000 range. So it's possible that maybe when we look, analyze your income, we might use less, uh, than a hundred thousand dollars, depending on maybe some averages, depends what type of income you have. Um, but what I would do is go to USDA eligibility's, uh, site. So you can just Google USDA, uh, income eligibility, and then from there, you can look up all of the counties and what their income limits are. So that might help you um, figure out. Everything else is good. Yes. This might be a good segment because at the bottom of that, he says that one of the main reasons why they're looking at it is because they have 2%, uh, less than 2% of the purchase price uh, in, in assets. So here's here's a good great segue into our uh, grant finder. Kyle worked his look at butt you. off. You're, you're so thing. right. That is a good segue. Um, yeah, let's do that. So, okay. So uh, if you go to winthehouseyoulove.com right here, um, and by the way, you can also get uh, pre-qualified with us. You can schedule a call um, with a mortgage advisor on our team. You'll be connected with either Dan, there he is, uh, Alan Platt or David Pies on our team. Um, all of them have over 20 years of experience each. Um, so you're in good hands uh, when you schedule a call with us. So uh, you can go to tools and then grant finder. And so in here, it's going to ask a couple questions um, to help you see if you can qualify for one of the grants that we have. Uh, so I'm going to say we're just looking at buying with me. Actually, no, well, let's run this scenario here. Um, so I'm going to have to make quite a few assumptions in here, um, but you'll have someone on the loan with you. So you said 800 plus credit. So what also is included is we would include uh, your wife's credit score as well um, if you're wanting her to be on the loan with you. So um, let's just say they're similar. Um, are either one of you a first time home buyer? We're going to say yes. And then from here, will it all fit? There we go. Um, you have two of the grants uh, are based on where you currently live, not where you're looking to buy, where you currently live. And these are all the areas that qualify here. Now, just a quick uh, disclaimer here. Just because you live in the city doesn't immediately mean that you qualify. It has to be verified with what's called a GOID. So I'll explain that here in a second. So if you live in one of these general areas, um, we're going to say yes or no. So we're going to say yes here because I don't see anything about where they currently live. So then what you'll do is you verify the census tract. Um, Dan, do you have an address on hand that we could do an example with, or maybe I should have grabbed that before we uh, 
we just, did it. And if not, I can just pull in a GUID. Yeah, just pull in a GUID. I don't have anything okay. on the top of my head. I can grab. Um, here's one that somebody was looking to buy. I hate to do this, so, but uh, God, uh, no, let's not do that. Let's not do. Uh, yep, I don't want to do that. I the only reason. So the only hesitation we have around here is I, I don't want to put people's addresses. Yeah. Uh, on you know on here so what we've been doing is trying to go to zillow and find homes for sale and it, it's just kind of hard to put people's addresses on screen without me feeling like someone's going to get docs completely um so basically yeah. this can feel a little overwhelming you just follow the one two three steps so you go to this website and enter your current address and then you're gonna there's gonna be a ton of different headings you find the one that says census tracks and right beneath that it's going to say goid so I'm going to enter in one uh, that we use as a demo, but yours is going to be different depending on where you currently live. Um, so from here, uh, oh, I also do have this thing. You can just click here to email me your current address, and I can also look up the GOID for you. I forgot that I added in, that in there. Um, so if you don't want to go through these steps, just click here uh, and then type in your address to me. That way I can look up uh, your GOID. So uh, you said 100,000 salary. Um, you said your wife does not have an income, so we're going to put zero here. Uh, then we don't have a place that they're looking in yet. Let's say that they're looking in, oh, let's say they're looking around, uh, what do you think is a good county to look in? Cook, Cook in? County, that's Chicago. Cook, sweet. Okay, we also have in here um, all the county limits in Illinois, so we can see uh, 100,000 is going to be above the top income limit. So it's going to disqualify one of the grants, which I'll show you here in a second. And then let's say we're looking at, uh, let's see, this said 320. Okay, so let's scroll down here. So it then shows us the grants that match our profile. Um, trying to get this all on screen. So three grants, one plus, we don't, this situation doesn't qualify because the income is too high. Like I just explained, there were no counties where $100,000 would work um, in this situation. However, there's Purchase Plus, which is $5,250, or Home Ready First, which is $10,000. So um, what we can do is scroll down here and look at a cost estimate comparison. So we're only looking at these two grants that we have. The cost before the grant, um, if we consider seller credits, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Did we talk about that earlier in the stream? No, nope, that was last week. Okay. Um, so seller credits basically is where you go to the seller and say, Hey, we'd like to purchase this home. You negotiate and say, could you give us a percentage of the, the purchase price towards our closing costs? So this is a really great way to help reduce the upfront cost of buying a home. Um, but it is something that has to be negotiated when you're looking at buying the house. So, uh, 2% is probably one to 2% is probably a good, I would say average. Uh, would that be fair to say, Dan? Yeah, usually it's about five or 6,000. So if we look at before the grant, we would have the down payment of 3%. And I see that's a little, it's a little small, isn't it? That might be a little bit better to see. Um, yeah, nice. You have the down payment here. We have closing cost estimates. So this is pulling in things like title insurance, property taxes, homeowners insurance. This is not just like what we charge as a lender. Um, these are all the costs that you're going to have with buying a home, really no matter what lender you work with. So then with seller credits, that then is applied here. So the total before the grant would be around $13,000 to buy a home. Um, now, uh, they were talking about having less than 2% of a $320,000 loan. So we're looking at around 6,400 as kind of our target that we want to get to. So Purchase Plus would have a $5,250 grant and then up to a $500 appraisal credit, which would bring the total due at closing to just shy of $7,400. Home Ready First is that $10,000 credit, a $500, up to a $500 appraisal credit, and up to a $500 home warranty credit, bringing the cash due at closing down to $2,100. So Dan, like you were mentioning, we kind of jumped into this because um, this person was looking at USDA initially to try to get the low down payment, is conventional loans with these grants can really get you quite a bit uh, or really lower the upfront cost of being able to get into a conventional loan. Um, even if, I'm curious to see if we pulled back the seller credit number, even if we brought the seller credit back to uh, just right there, uh, this would still be within kind of that target of the $6,400 that they were looking for. 
So this uh, calculator is going to be helpful for you finding, being able to find what grants you can match with, um, with us, and then also playing around with some of these numbers to see between the combination of grants and seller credits, um, could you get closer to an upfront cost number that's going to be uh, make home buying possible for you? Okay. Perfect. And the, everybody, just so you guys know, when you put in your applications, we automatically run this on your behalf. So most of the time, I probably take about 10 applications a day. There might be one person that's that knows about the grants or whatever. And uh, so we're trying our darndest to put this content out there for you guys. There's one bank in the whole country that I know of that's offering this program and we're set up with them. So if you talk to your realtor or your other mortgage company and they're like, oh, that doesn't exist. I lost three borrowers because their lender and their realtors all said that this this these programs does do not exist and uh you know that too bad for them because they just lost out on both of them qualified for the ten thousand dollar grant um do 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 let's see uh bootleg snacks uh i have recently successfully discharged from a chapter 13 bankruptcy uh, but want to tap into my home equity to do some real estate investing um do i realistic, realistically have options right now to do this you could, yeah, I, I don't know with a lot of the home equity loans out there, if you're, I don't know what your credit score is, but your chapter 13, normally a chapter 13, for those out there that don't know what it is, there's a chapter seven and a chapter 13. A chapter seven just wipes out all your debt. It's it's gone. You have to, you can only make a certain amount of income, but your debts are gone. They're poof. With the chapter 13, it's more of a restructuring of your debt, and then you have to make payments, usually about three to five years. So what happens is when you're qualifying for a normal mortgage, they look at when you initiated that uh, bankruptcy, and then like for FHA, you can, you can actually be in bankruptcy and still get a loan because you've been in there long enough, but you'd have to have proof that you've made every payment on time. One late payment, you're ineligible for anything you're probably looking for a home equity loan. Um, we, we have the program, but we really don't do, you know, we might do a couple a month because I always tell people, go to your local bank. If you're looking for a home equity loan, just call your local bank, see what they can offer you because many times it's free. Uh, so that's what I would suggest you do uh, because you probably have a, if you have a mortgage on the house that you're looking to you know pull money out of, the rate's probably crazy good. Uh, and you might have some tough, a tough time getting a home equity loan because of the chapter 13. Um, okay. Let's see here. Uh, what are FHA and USDA's rules on previous late payments on consumer debt, like credit cards, personal loans that are now current and on time? Um, so most, so FHA and USDA um, primarily are going to be run through uh, the automated underwriting system. And so that it's it functions like an algorithm, similar to kind of how social media, nobody really knows the algorithm that's going on behind the scenes. So sometimes they can change the rules based on risk and also uh, your uh, personal risk when they see from your credit profile and other things like your debt to income, um, the loan amount, the, the down payment and things like that. So having late payments doesn't you know, there aren't like hard and fast rules on the automated underwriting side um, that say if you have one payment, you won't be able to qualify. But as time goes on, those are going to have less and less impact. So I know it's it's hard to <laughs> it'd be nice to have a easy answer to say you can have two and that's it. Um, but when it comes to automated underwriting, it just doesn't work in an exact science like that, um, unfortunately. Cool. Um, Jay West Brookville, uh, when going through the buying process, do lenders look for a certain dollar amount to be saved? Um, also how do lenders look if someone gives gift funds for a down payment? Uh, look for a certain dollar amount. They're not really looking for a certain dollar amount. It's more of a percentage in, in reserves. Okay. So if you have, you don't have great credit, having a bunch of assets, equating out to reserves helps. And let me explain this. If you're buying a house and you, you need $10,000 down and you only have $10,000 down, it might get a little bit difficult to get you approved. Okay. Adding gift funds helps a little bit, but it's, it's basically the algorithms read it that they're gift funds versus your own funds. All right. So that's that part of it. Um, so the more assets, the more reserves you have, 
basically helps your chance. I was working uh, on a on a loan application last night, and I didn't think the guy had a ton of reserves. He says he has about ten grand, and that basically would this was his whole down payment. And I kept getting a, what's called a refer. It wouldn't approve the loan. Then I said, Hey, do you have any four hundred one k loan uh, uh, money or anything out there? Even though if you don't want to use it, he said he had twenty three thousand dollars in a four hundred one k. Uh, put that in there, the loan approved. So the more assets means the more reserves, meaning you have, you know, things got tight. What the reserves are is that's amount, how many months payments you would have to make your mortgage payment that's in the savings account. So the more of those you have, the better your chances getting approved as well. Um, Abby Jean, can we get the late payments resolved by asking for goodwill faith? Uh, you could try. Um, I could almost guarantee that there, if it's a real late payment, then it's not going to get removed by good faith. Um, the, cr the creditor really has no benefit of doing that for themselves. Um, so I've never heard of that happening, but it's something you could do. Um, the, really, the only thing with late payments that you're going to be looking at is if it was an error, uh, then you can get that disputed. But if it was a true late payment, it's very likely that the creditor isn't going to... Um, change that to being paid on time. Uh, Inma said, hello, I'm self-employed and don't have tax returns. Um, I was told at all, uh, I was told I can do a VOE loan. Oh, uh, do you offer that? And what are the downsides for it? Um, well, a VOE loan can't be done if you're self-employed because they would be calling a v like a verification of employment is where we would be talking with a, um, an employer about verifying your income. Um, but if you are the employer, it'd be like if I called Dan and said, how much do you make? <laughs> we'll, and we'll write that down for the loan. Um, so that wouldn't work. There are bank statement loans um, that would work in that situation. Or maybe you've heard of like 1099 loans. Um, but just from a straight VOE, uh, I, you can't do if you're self-employed. I don't know of any either, but let's just elaborate a little bit. You're self-employed and don't have tax returns. That might be, I'm just on legal, you have to file tax returns. Okay, so the IRS eventually is probably going to track you down uh, and, and you know notice that. And if so, you're going to be hit with a lot of uh, money owed and a lot of penalties. I'm just saying. Um, but you can get loans, like Kyle was saying, with bank statements and you know 1099 income. The, the downside of that is you're going to need much more of a uh, bigger down payment probably 10, 15, maybe 20% in some cases. And the rate's going to be probably about 2% higher than you would otherwise get. Uh, let's see, I'm under contract, but it no longer is good enough with my rate going from 6.5 to 7.6. I don't care uh, about losing the deposit. Do you recommend going to the builder to ask for a better incentive? Um, it's something that you could do. Um, if you're kind of at the point where you're like, I'm either going to walk or if you're at the point where you're going to walk, there's nothing to lose, I guess. Uh, but just being aware that, yeah, walking from a contract can uh, can result in you losing your deposit, um, which if you're okay with that, uh, that's it sounds like that's okay for you. Yes. Okay. Kyle and I were talking about just this right before we went live. Remember, we were, I, was, I was going through two oh, LE yeah. scenarios with him. They're both builders. Okay. Here's, here's a loan estimate I got today, and this one floored me. Well, it's normal, I guess. They were coming back and the people, uh, the person sent in a loan estimate and it was, the rate was, it was an FHA loan. The rate was 6.99 and they were being charged $15,899 in fees for that rate. And it's an FHA loan. And this was locked last Wednesday when rates, before rates even took this huge jump. Okay. So here's what's happens. The seller, the builder is giving them $13,000 in credits to buy down the you know rate and the fees and everything. So there was 15, I'll say $16,000 in fees at a rate at point 6.99 FHA. Okay. I, I, I'm, I know legally I have to go over APRs and all that stuff. This is just a demonstration of, a, of an application I got in today. We were able to offer the same rate with no lender fees, meaning no points, no uh, underwriting fee and no processing fee. Okay. They were being charged $16,000 for it, the same rate. And the rate today is probably about three eighths higher than what it would have been on the 11th when they locked in. So basically what's happening is this, the, the builder saying, okay, we're giving you $15,000 $15, in credits. 
Many of them, I'm not going to be legally liable here, but a lot of these builders have ownership in the, these mortgage companies. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So what they're doing is they're basically going, okay, we'll give you 15,000 in, in credits, and then we're just going to suck it right back in all these junk fees that we're going to hit you for. Because how you validate it is I can give them the same rate with no fees. Okay, and Kyle and I were talking about it this morning, and we're like, okay, what's the incentive of them coming to us? There is none. But they're really not getting anything out of this. So when you went to from six and a half to seven point six, that's huge. What I would suggest you do: send us your loan estimate or whatever you have. I need to know your uh, just send me your loan estimate. But I will need to know your um, credit scores and your income, and I'll run it. I might be able to get you a rate in between there with you know minimal fees. So that's where a lot of people are getting hosed right now. I don't blame you. Take it. But it, the, the, the benefits or the credits they're giving you are basically just going, they're giving it to you and they're just taking it right back and putting it right back in their profit margins. Yeah. Uh, I added Dan's uh, email right here, dan at the rate update.com. Um, if you want to go ahead and email that over. Um, doo -doo -doo. Brian said, uh, in Savannah, question is the housing pricing just correcting itself to what it should be? Um, Interesting. Uh, do you mean like in your market, is it going up or down? Um, kind of I'd be curious to hear what's what you're seeing in your market and, and what you're thinking yeah. there. Um, Tira Scott. Uh, hi, guys. Thanks for your videos. Um, they've been helpful. My husband and I purchased the affordability calculator. Checking in from Austin. Are taxes owed to the IRS calculated in your DTI? Um, so if you're on a monthly plan, uh, the taxes... Uh, like if you have a back taxes and you're on a monthly plan, that would be included in your debt to income ratio. Um, however, if it's just general taxes, like end of year taxes, uh, then no, that's not included in your debt to income ratio. It would only be in your debt to income ratio if you're on a payment plan um, with the IRS. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, Baylor two times said, uh, what I want to do is unconventional. Maybe I want to build a uh, buy lot and build multifamily with an all-in-one loan. I'm a first-time home buyer in Alabama. Credit score is 760. Down payment is 50 to 60,000. We just brought in uh, somebody at, uh, on our team that will assist with uh, building. Um, so it's a one-time one -time build. Um, we were trying to do those, but it took up so much of our time that we actually just brought in. We actually went out to the bank. Um, Kyle and I work at uh, ServeBank. We were allied First Bank. We got bought out. Now we've just basically, it's a name change. Uh, so I reached out to the bank and says, hey, you know, is there somebody there that could assist us with construction loans? So we do have a young lady helping us with those. Uh, so if you do want to reach out to us, shoot me an email, give me the, some of the criteria. I'll send it over to the young lady and then uh, sync you two up and make sure you're being taken care of. Uh, so that, that's one area that we're, we're trying to get out of. It's, it, it is so time consuming, but, um, you know, if you are constructing homes, we at least want to be, you know, be able to offer you something, but yeah, just uh, shoot me an email and I'll, I'll hook you up with the girl on our end who uh, can handle construction loans. Uh, KJ said, can you please explain how buying down rate works and what's the typical cost? Um, example would be great to go over based on recent rates and pricing. Um, do you want me to pull up Lund Scepter? Do you have the the calculator, the two one buy down calculator or anything? I can see. Um, it yeah, but were they talking about uh, permanent or temporary, or maybe we just go over both? Buy down rate works. Oh wait, apparently I have your password changed since the last time I logged in here. Um, so we can cover, maybe we can just do a highlight of both. Um, so when buying down the rate, um, there's two different types of ways that this can happen. Uh, there's a permanent buy down. So this is where you pay upfront money, um, to buy down the rate for the entire loan. Uh, you know, if it's 30 years, it's bought down for 30 years. So for instance, you might pay one point, which is 1% of the loan amount. I think of it like an upfront interest and that lowers your interest rate. So one point um, isn't going to change your interest rate by one percentage point. It may change it by an eighth or a quarter of a point. Um, so a temporary buy down is basically where the seller um, or builder helps you pay the monthly payment for there's different ones, but it might be two years, three years, maybe even only just one year. Um, so on my website, I do have an explanation for uh, 
the two one buy down. So if you're interested in a temporary buy down, this one explains how the whole thing works. Um, so for instance, if you're looking at a $450,000 house um, with let's say uh, about a 7.25% interest rate, it would show you your one, two, and three, what happens with your payment. So with a two one buy down, basically in year one, your rate is 2% lower. Uh, in year two, it's 1% lower. And then in year three, it's fixed for the rest of the loan. And so this whole thing, I won't go into all the details here, but it will show you exactly how much you need um, from the seller or the builder to help you with this, what happens when you refinance and whole uh, breakdown here. Fantastic. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's see what other questions we have. Uh, Triple Uno said, uh, we removed our loan contingency because we thought the loan was for sure. Um, the condo HOA questionnaire came back with critical repairs, so our loan would be denied. Uh, chances seller gives us our earnest money back. Um, I The chances question, when people ask about what are my chances of something, it's always a very tough question to answer because I, I know yeah. people want an answer but it's not helpful for me to be like 30%. Um, really, we, you probably more want solutions than you want chances. Uh, your solution here is if you're working with a real estate agent, this is their job. Um, I believe the primary job of a real estate agent is not to show you a house, but really to help you find exits to your contract to help save your money and save you uh, legally um, if you need to exit a contract. This is exactly what a real estate agent is supposed to do. If your real estate agent doesn't know how to help you with this, um, have them take it up with their uh, broker um, to help you figure this out. Because if you can't get out on the financing contingency, um, then there may be some other contingency that you can find in that contract. A good real estate agent is going to help you um, structure ex exits in the contract via contingencies to make sure that you have as many exits as possible. Um, but if you waived your financing contingency, there's really no way to get it back. Um, the And I feel like if you have an agent, they shouldn't have told you to remove a loan contingency to begin with, especially if it's uh, a deal that's already uh, been negotiated to begin with. I don't see the advantage in that necessarily. Um, you may be able to, some contracts do have a period of time where you can actually review uh, the HOA bylaws. And that may be an option where you can come back and say, we reviewed the HOA and its financials. And even though the loan contingency isn't something we can get out on, you may be able to have some sort of contingency with the HO or in your contract with reviewing HOA docs and saying, hey, the HOA was mismanaged and that's what, how we're going to get out of the contract. Usually that's only like a few days after you receive HOA docs though. So um, I know it's a little bit of a broad answer, but this is exactly what your real estate agent is for and helping you understand uh, what your options are here. I would never tell you to waive your appraisal, waive your inspections, waive your anything. This is the biggest purchase you're ever going to make in your life. You know, be careful is all I got to say. Yeah, th those contingencies are all designed to protect you. Um, yep. And the only people who should be waiving those are people who have large sums of cash and are willing to spend it, um, at least in my opinion. You see a lot of those videos and those things where, you know, people are just like they're devastated because I bought a house and now I hate it and this and that. If you take a deep dive into it, most of the times they 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 flawed in several different areas that they did. Um, and, and then you look back to it and say, why did you do that? And then why did you do that? No wonder this is where you're at. And it could even be that much worse. Mm -hmm. So yeah, be careful with all these things. Be Do, do your due diligence on everything to make sure you're in a good position. Guess who's in here? Dylan who's Bly. Here? What's up? What up? <laughs> uh, Anthony, uh, I see a great first time homeowner forgivable loan here in Minnesota that I'm interested in. If my wife and I make more than the income limit combined, can we simply use one income source to qualify? Um, yes, as long as you can qualify for the loan, you uh, can be, and that puts you under the income limit. Um, that's something that you can do with most programs. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Jonathan, um, okay, so for questions like this, I have a calculator that helps you do that. It's called the Loan Clarity Advisor. There's a link in the description to it. Um, you can compare all different types of loans and scenarios, and it shows you which one is better. Um, and so that may be a, a good option there for you. 
Uh, Jay said, the more that I pay off my house, meaning year after year, eventually will the payment go down the less that I owe? No, your payments, it's basically when you take out a mortgage, uh, it, what, what it is, is it amortizes or breaks down that payment over that amount of years. So if it's a 30 year term, you you have the exact same payment other than let, let's just, just assume you don't have your taxes and insurance included in your pay, payment because every year we know our taxes are most likely going to go up a little bit and your insurance is going to go up a little bit. So your payment will change. But let's just say if you have a principal and interest payment only, that payment will never change until the last payment is due. And then the last payment will be basically just be the balance owed on that loan. So no, yep. your payment will never change all the way through the term of the loan. Yeah. You could do a recast. Um, usually, do you know what the recast minimum is? Uh, I want to say it's usually around a couple thousand dollars. Um, basically, a recast is where you go to your mortgage company and say, hey, I have a lump sum. Could you recalculate my monthly payment based on this lump sum? Um, and that could lower the payment. Um, but that's the really only benefit to a recast is to help lower the payment rather than to um, help you save money on interest long term. Uh, oh, so there was a question here. Oh, Daniel. Uh, Daniel, you asked, uh, do I need to contact my bank that owns my home loan to add funds to my escrow, or do they not accept extra escrow funds outside of my monthly mortgage payment? Um, you only would need to add money to your escrow account if they if there's an escrow shortage. So at the end of uh, every year, your lender um, or whoever's servicing your home loan is going to do an escrow analysis. Basically, after they paid for your taxes and homeowner's insurance, they're going to see how much money is left in the account and if they need any more. And if there's a shortage, they'll come to you and say, hey, we're short by $500. Um, and what they may do is say, you can either pay that now to make up the difference or uh, you can pay us, you know, we'll increase your monthly payment by X amount per month to make up for that shortage. So there's really never a situation in where you need to add extra funds just because you want to, to the escrow account. If you're going to add extra into your mortgage, you just want it to be applied towards uh, the principal and not your uh, escrow account. Um, JC, local realtor is pressing us to buy right now uh, before the rates come down and refinance later. Um, so you want to touch on that first and then we can touch on the refinance. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's dissect this because this is a huge question. Okay. So I'm going to read it in detail and I'll emphasize the areas I want to emphasize and we'll talk about it. So local realtor is pressing to buy now before rates come down and refinance later. Is it expensive to refinance or it, it very least delays significant equity gains on the property? So don't try to buy a house that you can afford now. Don't assume that, you know, in six months or a year or whatever, the rate's going to come down. If it comes down, kudos. It's going to only save you money. But what I want you to do is focus in on, can you afford it now? Is the payments affordable to you now? Don't, you know, that's what I want you to, the main focus in us. So now what happens if and when rates come down? Okay. So let's give you some timing behind things. If you have a conventional loan, you could basically refinance the next day. Okay. What I, some people that are doing the builder loans, they're like, okay, my, my builder's in phase three now, and I've, I put in on phase two. So phase three, houses are already $50,000 more, my same house, because now they're in phase three. So they ask us a question. So, you know, what should we do? Should we use the, our builder's lender or whatever? I'm like, yes, take all their free money you can get, buy, or buy the house, and then call us the next day and refinance. Okay, the refinancing is a fraction of the costs because when you're buying a house, all this title work needs done, all the legal, all the legal paperwork has to be put into your name and recordings and all this. So you're probably looking at five to ten thousand dollars when you're buying a home, you know, throughout the United States. When you're refinancing, that cost is probably about a thousand to fifteen hundred bucks. Okay. And you're going to skip a mortgage payment. So that mortgage payment you're going to skip is basically equivalent to, or more than your cost would be anyways. That's what I would highly suggest. Don't buy right now. And the assumption is, well, in six months, the federal reserve is going to reduce rates. So my, yeah. my payments will go down. I don't want you in that spot because you know, you're going to be struggling like heck for six months. And then if rates don't come down now, where are you? So please yeah. don't, don't rush into this. It's the biggest purchase you're ever going to make in your life. Yeah. Uh, so be careful is all I got to say. Um, do, do, do. Let us see what else we have. Uh, oh, Inma, to your question, you said too many write-offs, so it's lower than I would qualify for. I was told they only use my 
pay stub and bank statements. It sounds like maybe you're, you're self, you have a self-employed business and also you are employed. Um, so if that's the case, cause I know your other comment said you're self-employed, um, and, ma and maybe I'm misunderstanding, but, uh, if you're in the situation where you are employed and also you have maybe a side business or maybe you do some gig work, um, the self-employed portion is going to be, uh, analyzed separately from your W2 pay because the self-employed por portion, um, we're going to be looking at effectively your net income of the business, um, not just gross income. So if you write off a lot of expenses from your self-employed uh, income, then that's going to lower the amount of self-employed income that we can use. Um, but there's no write-offs on the personal side. If you're just like a W-2 employee, um, then there's no write-offs that you would do that uh, we really take a look at on the W-2 side. Um, to remove someone on the loan is my only option to refinance. Uh, yes. Um, lenders aren't really willing to just let somebody off of a loan. Um, it really, the only other option is to, uh, to refinance. Um, cool, cool, cool. So we are, uh, can you do one last one? And I'd I like sure to see the, the KJ. KJ, great stuff. Is this the one? Oh, no, wait, no, keep going. Okay. Here we go. This one. Okay. This is, this is what we see. I, I, I see this probably 10 times a day and I'm not exaggerating. Builders offering 3% discount uh, for purchase price to use their mortgage option. Is it worth it or should use it? Use it. 3%. I don't know what your purchase price is. Even if it's 200 grand at $6,000, use it. And then right after there, you know, depending on the rate and everything, send me your loan estimate. Actually, we're working on it right now. Actually, Kyle, it's another one that I throw on the Kyle's pile. We're trying to compile. You guys give us a thumbs up if, you, if you'd if you like this uh, added to our websites. Once you close on a loan, uh, we just talked about refinancing. It's not, it's not that hard. It's not that expensive. Would you like if we put you into a database, you can give us just your name and email address and your loan amount rate and so forth. Once rates do, it, or when they do re hit a point where they're a half a percent lower than what you have now, we would just send you out an alert saying, hey, would you guys like to, uh, you know, review the numbers with us? And we would, you know, you might, you're in a position to save money. And so every half a percent the rate drops, you'll just get triggered a little alert saying, hey, would you like to just look at the numbers? So if you guys would give us a thumbs up or thumbs down, if you think that would be handy, uh, most of the people that I talk to on a daily basis that gives us these questions, I answer exactly that. Take it. Take the builder's loan. I make money by closing your loans, but I don't. I want you to be in the best best position you can be. So I'm not going to put you in a worse position financially just to do your loan. That's not how we operate. Uh, so take the loan, send us your information, and then when rates hit, you know, a half a percent or a full percent below where you're at at this point, we'll just alert you saying, "Hey, give us a call if you're interested in looking at the numbers." So would you guys like that, or would you not like that? Give me, give me the kudos out there. But that's that's what we see on a daily basis. These builders are putting out all these incentives and many of them are just giving you the same rate that you, we would get you otherwise. It's just them recapturing the money, but just take their loans. I mean, seriously, I hate to say it that way, but yeah. Uh, do loan brokers officer, officers make a commission on points purchased? No. Um, so loan officers uh, of all kinds with everywhere, um, cannot make any extra money on points um, and cannot make any extra money on the type of loan that's being used. Like you, uh, a loan officer can't get paid for a, more for an FHA loan versus a conventional loan or something like that. Um, that would be uh, steering and is super uh, illegal. So no, that, that can't happen. What's happening when a lot of loan officers are putting, um, they're showing borrowers quotes with a lot of points because they know that most people are just looking at the interest rate and not the upfront costs. Um, and what people are kind of doing is they're like, look at the low interest rate I got, but it's like the, what we Dan was talking about. Yeah, but you paid $15,000 for it. Odds are uh, you may find a lower rate to be able to refinance in before you uh, break even on the amount of money that you paid um, for that. And so what we've been finding over the past couple of years as rates has got, have gone up is loan officers add a bunch of points to give you that lower rate rate because when you're looking at other lenders they want to seem like they have the lowest rate possible um you know for instance if you go to uh let me think about this can i show this example without getting sued um think about uh <laughs> Be there's careful. a big there's a big uh 
lender that you're probably familiar with that has lots of commercials. Um, and if you go to their rate section on their website, in little fine details, you see that you're paying two points. Um, okay, that's 2% of your loan amount. So if you have a $300,000 loan amount, they're immediately assuming that you're paying $6,000 in fees just for the interest rate that they're showing you. And so it's kind of this little like you go to their website and say, oh, wow, they have such a better rate than everybody else. But everyone else would have the same rate if you ask them to charge you the same amount of money. Um, so it's really not a super fair comparison. Um, so Dude, that was before. right on the money. That was right on the money. I get it all the time. Once we lock people in, they're like, hey, well, this other place is showing that the, you know, the rate's you know, 299. And I'm like, it can't be 299. It doesn't even exist. And then they send me the thing and I'm like, see that where you can't see it down at the bottom? Blow that up. Take a picture of your, on your phone, blow it up, and you'll see what I'm talking about. They're charging you a ton of fees. So, you know, most people are strapped right now just to make the down payment and your monthly payments. You know, try to save that money where you can. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, one last thing here is ZL said, I bet no one uh, thought uh, we would be near 8% at this point. If consumer spending doesn't stop and inflation continues to soar, is it 9% rates within the realm of possibility? And then to add on to that, uh, Dylan said, is inflation data worrying you a bit, Dan? Um, do you think there's a possibility that the Fed raises rate even higher? Yeah, so I, I don't, I, I honestly, and a lot of people just give me flack on my channel on a daily basis. Like, Dan, you told us rates are coming down or whatever. I'm, you have the Federal Reserve. Here, here's how I'll pronounce it. You have people on Wall Street that make billions. You have Federal Reserve members. They are even telling us, you know, rate, inflation's coming down. We're going to cut rates. Even the Fed said that they're going to cut rates three times this year. Now, that data is starting to back off quite, back off quite a bit. I'm even in the camp now. You have to analyze the data. Okay, so you can't just, you know, you can't say eight months ago, well, in May 1st, it's going to be sunny because it normally is sunny. Well, we don't know until May 1st comes. It might rain, but historically, May 1st has always been sunny. So that's what we try to do. We try to take all the data that we're getting, but what's really messing things up is, is like over the weekend, you had Iran bombing Israel, and I'm not going to get political, but that was going to have a huge impact on oil. And there was... Uh, the good thing is it didn't wasn't as catastrophic as it we thought it was going to be. They were thinking oil prices might go to 100 bucks a barrel. The oil's in everything, folks. So if you have that happening, you're going to have, you know, things happening in the markets. You also have immigration. I'm not going to get political, but you have even illegal immigration. They're even saying that's been in the tune of since COVID, we've probably had 10 million people come into the country illegally. Well, those people aren't just you know, sleeping on the sidewalks, those people are looking for places to live and places to work. Okay. So that's adding to our workforce. So when you see the jobs numbers going way up, you have to really concentrate where is the jobs coming from? You know, a lot of the jobs are in the service area. Okay. COVID, everything stopped. All the hospitality, everything stopped. So people, you know, maybe some people went back to another country. Um, or just didn't work for a while. Now you have a lot of people coming into it and a lot of the immigrants take these service jobs. So if you really look at the jobs numbers, wages aren't really going up and everybody's saying, well, wage growth isn't there to help you know offset the price of, of homes. Well, what jobs are being created in the servicing and the hospitality section? So there's, it's, there's a huge disconnect right now in the markets. We've never seen an economy like ourselves that pumped in so much money into the economy over a bad time now trying to suck out that money uh, because, you know, people were flush with money and I've shown it to everybody, you know, a hundred times on my videos showing you that in 2020 and 2021, people had the most money ever in history, ever in history in their bank accounts and they were spending it. And cause, and we had supply chain issues, and everything just spiked up uh, the prices of everything. But now you have consumers continuing to spend at these high prices. They're complaining about it, but nobody's slowing down. So, as a as a shop owner, if I'm selling stuff, I'm like, well, why do I got to cut my prices? Uh, people are buying out, you know, buying all my, all the products on my shelf anyways. So I'll just keep them at higher profit margins. That's what you're seeing. Then you're seeing insurance. Insurance is nuts. My mom's, I just had to uh, insure, uh, get my mom's house insured. The premium doubled since last year and she's on fixed income. So you have a multitude of things coming out that there is no, you know, I can't really say if it was a normal market, 
I'd say, well, let's look at the 10 year treasury, which is at 4.6. We're going to add historically 1.5 to that, which would give us five, 6% interest rates. That's what the mortgage rate should be. And that's historically, where is it today? Seven and a half. So there's a huge disconnect and there's a whole bunch of things that's causing that. And the, the Federal Reserve is monitoring and I, I agree with what they're doing. They're saying, okay, we don't need to lower rates because people continue to buy and buy and buy. They want to feel the pain. They want you to feel the pain when you're buying stuff to say, I'm not going to buy it. And they need people to stop buying and the prices to come down. So there's, you know, that's good. That is called, you know, that's bringing down inflation. So that it's, it's really hard to predict right now. I'm not expecting the Federal Reserve to come in and raise rates. I think we're at neutral and above on their, on their side of the equation. They're going to wait until the data comes in. And, and just, you know, a month ago, everybody was saying, oh, there's three rate cuts in it. And I was saying the same thing. Then we had CPI, PPI, and the jobs numbers come out. And I was like, Oof, this ain't good. You know, things aren't tapering down. So we're probably going to have higher for longer. So I changed my position and I have no problem changing my position. That's what it is. So I don't expect rates to hit nine. Um, I don't really, I didn't call that even eight right now. I thought when we were went below seven, we were going to stay below seven, but I never thought, you know, Iran was going to bomb um, Israel. I never thought the Gaza Strip was going to happen. I didn't think oil prices was going to go the way they are and so forth. So that's what's really driving all this stuff. In a normal market, you know, you would see rates at six and a half, you know, percent today based on the 10 year treasury. And on that note, <laughs> got my blood up. <laughs> this is right in the wheelhouse that I talk about, folks. So I appreciate you asking. Um, so we, uh, our team works in all 50 states. So if you're looking at getting pre-qualified, we first start with a free consultation call. There's no cost. There's no obligation. We're not going to harass you. Um, you pick a time on our calendar so you know it works for you. You know it works for us. Um, and we're not going to chase you down. We don't have time to harass you all day like other lenders who are going to call you like 20 times. Um, so what you can do is schedule a call and talk with a member of our team. You either be connected with Dan, um, Alan Platt on our team or David Pies. So all of them have over 20 years of experience each. Um, so they can answer your questions. If you had a question here that, uh, today that we couldn't get to, um, it wasn't on purpose. It's not because we don't like you. We love that you're here, but we can't answer all the questions. So, but that's why we have these consultation calls. Um, and then afterwards you can start a, uh, 15 minute application um, where you enter in some info about your situation, like uh, your income and uh, assets that you have. And really that helps us see the whole picture. It's hard to um, give you really accurate answers without us seeing the whole picture first um, that we can advise you on. From there, we'll help you see what you qualify and what quotes um, you're taking a look at. So you don't have to come in and say, I just want an FHA loan. We look at all of your loan options, like Dan mentioned earlier, we're also running the grant finder to see if there's any grant opportunities um, that we can get for you as well. We'll show you what those quotes look like, your monthly payment, uh, your upfront cost. And from there, you can start shopping for a home. And again, there's no obligation here. Um, once you start the process, you're not locked into anything. Uh, you don't have to buy a home. You can start looking at some homes, seeing if there's some that you like. And if you don't like it, nothing bad happened. <laughs> I think people can feel like... Uh, they start this process and it's all of a sudden it's going to be like rock tumbling down a hill and they'll never be able to stop it. At any point, you can just say, I don't want to buy a house anymore, or you're going to wait it out for another couple months and that's perfectly fine. Um, so thank you all for being here. We'll be doing the same thing next week, next Wednesday, uh, 3.30 Eastern. And uh, we'd love to see you there. In the meantime, um, you're welcome to reach out to us, winthehouseyoulove.com uh, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, folks.